Hello everyone, and welcome to PlatformCon, and also welcome to my talk, which is titled The Golden Age of the Platform. My name is James Bokett, and I'm the Technical Delivery Director for a hands-on development consultancy named Open Credo. We help clients deliver more effectively across a variety of different areas, as you see on the screen there. But the ones most appropriate for this talk is, is data and platform engineering. Traditionally, we've done a lot of work in these areas, but recently I was talking to a, an e-commerce customer whose sales material talked about the services they offer, such as warehousing and order fulfillment as a platform. So these are things that happen in the real world, but they were referring to them as their delivery platform. And then I started to think about all the different uses of the platform concept. And it started to dawn on me that we're really entering into a golden age of the platform. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at a few different kinds of platform, what makes them the same or different, and how we can accelerate their adoption so we can get the good bits that platform have to offer so we can get to those good bits faster. So here's a, a quiz for you. So what do these cars have in common? They're all design classics in their own way. You've got four Citroen cars and a couple of V-dubs there. But all of these are built using the same uh, 2CV car platform. So the, the different uh, styling on top, which is also known as the top hat, which I love that term, uh, the different styling on top is built on top of the 2CV platform. So if cars use a platform for their chassis and e-commerce companies offer warehousing and fulfillment as a platform of real world services, then surely we've got an overloaded term. I actually don't think so. I think it shows a convergence of thought around a similar concept that can be applied to different contexts. I mean, you could call that thought a platform, but I think that might be a little bit too meta, even for a conference talk. So what do V-Dub Beatles and warehousing mean for the kinds of platforms that we think about at PlatformCon? Let's look to Jenga for the answer. So uh, why have I got a picture of Jenga at a PlatformCon talk? So this illustrates my point. If I think back over the last five to 10 years, there's one overarching theme that's come up with all the teams that I've worked with or, or done team leading with. Development is now more difficult than it ever was. And it really shouldn't be because we've got all these extra tools, you know, uh, Copilot and ChatGBT that's going to write code for us and make us all redundant in three years. But with the advent of these modern development techniques from the 12 factor app through to the two pizza teams, now everyone has to have a DevOps mindset and have be, a, be an expert in a long laundry list of technologies. But whichever language you code in to your compil, compile and build cycle, probably with multiple microservices or modules, with end-to-end -end tests wrapped in Docker containers that get deployed to the cloud or a Kubernetes cluster, or more likely a Kubernetes cluster running in the cloud. Maybe that's all provisioned with Terraform or Ansible, and quite possibly you're having some secrets injected in there just for good measure. So it's really hard to be an expert in everything. And please, if you do know someone, please let me know because I will hire them. Um, so we've come up with these platforms as a way to abstract away some or all of this complexity in modern development. I mean, we've had to. Otherwise, we'll just drown in the complexity. So what do we mean by a platform? And for the purposes of this talk, I've kind of come up with this definition that I kind of like, which is a platform is an abstraction layer that provides a consistent, predictable suite of facilities and features that caters for all of the communities that it serves. I mean, that means that I can apply this way of thinking to these different kinds of platforms, and we can have a look at their similarities and differences, and also their paths to adoption. So let's think about the, the themes for success. The, by the way, the relevance of the picture is that that is a triumph or success. It's a triumph for TR3X. Um, so can we create some themes around success? You know, the three platforms that we've talked about, IDPs, um, otherwise known as kind of uh, uh, your traditional uh, CI, CD pipeline, data mesh and ML ops, they all serve distinct, different purposes but they do have some common themes for success, as we'll see. So the first one, and if there's one thing I would, I would like you to take away from this presentation, it's this. Product thinking is absolutely key to your success when building a platform. You have to put the communities at the heart of your roadmap. If you don't, you run the risk of building a monument to your own greatness or intellect, 
or just some white elephant that no one will use and therefore be quite costly as well into the bargain. So you want your platform to be used, yeah, right? Sounds good. So then ask the people who will use it what they want. You want, to have, you want people to have faith in your platform. Give them something that's high quality, that's reliable, that's durable. Your platform will never be complete. You've got to keep your communities updated with a roadmap and tell them what you're building and plan to build. Try to keep to your delivery dates, and that's not always easy. I do know that. I'm a delivery director after all. Um, if you can't, tell them and tell them why you can't. You know, what, what's great, what would be ideal, is if they, they pick up a shovel and start um, building with you in the trenches and helping you out. But you've got to bring them along for the journey. Maybe you could do some product uh, focus groups or customer research or surveys. Now, if you're thinking about sort of data mesh, we're talking about data mesh in terms of product thinking. It's baked into the very fabric of data mesh. It's, kind of, it's front and center. The books and the blog posts mandate this up front. So, I mean, the whole point is to create data products with quoted SLAs for quality and delivery. So that's kind of inherent in the data mesh approach. For an IDP, this is perhaps less obvious. If you're thinking, well, we've got Jenkins and Argo CD, so we're done. It's not very curated, is it? It's no roadmap. And what do users get from that? You know, do you know how comfortable your users are going to be with Docker containers and Helm charts and the kind of the, the, the endless amounts of YAML that people need to write in these things? And do the security folks get what they need? Do they have an audited and transparent process? You know, all too often you see continuous delivery within finance and banks where they say, we're going to do this just before they go into production. And the banks go, or the security folks go, no, you're not. They're a community and they're a very important community and you need to bring them into the fold and make sure they've got everything they want from your platform, whatever it might be. If you're thinking in the, in the ML ops world, uh, there was a really great article in Gartner that said that most data science projects actually fail because they don't focus on the business outcomes that they're trying to achieve. So this is effectively product thinking, actually saying, what is the outcome I want here? So for any kind of platform, you've got to put those communities or users right at the heart. Otherwise, you may easily build the wrong thing and it will hamper your adoption because it's not right for the users. Um, there's an old parable uh, or adage. Um, if you give someone a fish, they'll feed themselves for a day. Teach them to fish and, they'll feed, and you can, they'll feed themselves for a lifetime. Now, in this case, they might not feed themselves for a lifetime. They might just go and open a sushi restaurant. But the theme for success here is about empowering your communities. If you're an IDP owner, you don't want your platform teams bogged down in the day-to-day -day drudgery of creating new pipelines for users. You want your pipeline um, development team, effectively, your platform engineers, to be creating new templates and new fangled ways of your users actually creating pipelines. Um, if you own a data platform, you don't want your teams telling the different sets of users the same thing about your data product, how to use it, what the content is, how to access it. No, what you want to do is to publish your product, be that a data product or a pipeline for code or ML models or anything, and publish all the metadata about that product, how to use it along with any APIs as well. Now this goes hand in hand with the next recommendation, the third one, which is discoverability. Your platform services and features should be able to self-describe or self-document. Now put those documents somewhere that people can access it, and you need to create that culture of documentation within your team. The stick, as in the carrot and the stick, the stick being for your team is that otherwise they're going to just have to explain the same thing lots of times to different users, and that is boring for them. Now, if you think of the, the tools in something like Google Docs or G Suite, whatever it's called this week, um, the features are made available. They're all made available and they all kind of make sense. Things are where you expect them to. There's an edit menu and uh, copy and is, is control C. You know, things are where you expect them to be. And they behave the way you expect them to. They're internally consistent. Make your products do the same. For instance, data products, maybe you've got an account identifier or a customer identifier. Call it the same thing everywhere. Same case of the field name, the same data type. So you can empower your users to find out for themselves what they can do with your platform. So with a little bit of effort, it, it means that the user can actually stand on their own two feet as well. In the case of an IDP, ensure your conventions are tight across all the facilities and features. If you use snake case or camel case, use it everywhere. Don't mix it up. As soon as you mix it up, 
you're increasing the cognitive load on the teams and therefore slowing them down and therefore spoiling their experience of your platform. And as soon as they've got a, a negative experience, they will evangelize a negative experience as well. And let's face it, it doesn't take much for techies to complain about stuff. The fourth one is curation or providing a curated platform experience. If you've got lots of different services that all need config to match, um, try creating some tooling to dry up that config. Encapsulate the uh, config within one new piece of document. You know, maybe it's YAML or some, some piece of config. And that controls all, and then write a tool that reads that config and configures all of your different systems. So for instance, you might have something that talks about users and groups. You might need to configure an LDAP server, a database, and maybe some REST endpoint permissions for a Spring Boot application or something like this. If you've got that all in one document, one config document, and you've got a tool that runs in some kind of pipeline, some kind of automation, that means that you've, you've lowered the cognitive load on your users because they supply that config in one document and then your tooling then takes care of keeping it all consistent with all of the different tools, all of the different platforms within the ecosystem. And curation is especially important in data mesh. Don't just broadcast all your data for the world to use, only publish out that data which is useful. And hopefully it's gonna be modeled in the domain and then you don't need to support everything in the world, just the curated bit. And then you won't be answering endless questions about the dangly ends or the pieces of data that don't really make sense or don't match up to anything. You're just doing the, you're just supporting the curated piece. And it means you can evolve your schema and you can evolve your data underneath it because you know what your contract is to the outside world. And if I think about one of the world's biggest platforms, AWS, they've taken this to the nth degree. At first, it might look like that enormous list of AWS, AWS services don't look very curated, but in fact, it really is. There's a real product owner sitting behind each and every one of those services. And they almost run like businesses within AWS. It, each of those services has its own general manager that makes those teams independent of each other for fast flow. But it does come at the expense of a little bit of duplication and some of the consistency is lost between the shit. Um, and that comes up that comes up when you have a, um, a shared service like the AWS console because the, the UI elements maybe look a tiny bit inconsistent. Now, the last one is also uh, a very important one as well, is feedback loops. So I have got this great quote here in front of me that says, strategy should evolve out of the mud of the marketplace, not in the antiseptic environment of the ivory tower by somebody called Al Rees. So ivory towers are never a good thing, least of all when you're defining a platform. You want your platform, you don't want your platform to be a white elephant. So feedback is super, super important. And as we said earlier, you wanna treat your platform like a project product with SLAs and putting the user at the heart of everything that you do. This includes listening to your users and facilitating their feedback and incorporating it into your product roadmap. You want your users to be bought into what you're doing so they can evangelize for the platform for you. They do your work for you and make it easier for them to onboard their apps onto your, um, onto your platform. But you can only do that with real world feedback. You wanna know if your platform is still relevant as well. And you definitely want to know if people feel the need to circumvent your platform in order to get their work done, because you want to find out what users are finding difficult, do less of this, what they're finding easy, do more of this, and most importantly, what are they going to need the platform to do next in order to deliver their next set of features? If you take uh, an IDP example, not everyone needs to be Netflix, but what you actually might find, you've got communities that actually have long maybe testing cycles, maybe they actually only can release once a quarter because maybe they're a risk system in a bank or something and it's, and it's um, really important that they have this regulatory uh, guarantee around their, their software. But also that same community, that same dev team might be able to push out or might want to push out hot fixes very, very quickly for things that don't affect the core risk model. But you'll need to, and there'll be differences between your communities as well as within the individual community. You need to cater for both. In the data mesh world, there's actually a very well defined doctrine for this in terms of data councils and federated data governance. You need the consumers of your data data products to be able to feed back as to what they what they see in the data, what they need from the data, 
in order to enhance those things. Maybe they say, actually, I need this data in real time or something like that. They need to have a forum by which they can raise those things. In the ML world, feedback takes on an entirely different meaning because feedback is where you're actually um, uh, where well, you're actually running a new model and maybe some new uh, parameters and things, and you need to actually feed back into that loop to see whether that application, maybe the application that consumes that model, actually whether that still works, whether it's better, whether it's worse. So you meet, m might need some programmatic way of incorporating this feedback back into your pipeline. But overall, user satisfaction should be your number one metric for all your users, groups, or communities. So in conclusion, platforms are everywhere. Technology, unfortunately, is the easy part. You'll always encounter socio-technical problems, and that's the tough bit. And there'll always be haters, but show them the way by using product thinking to create discoverable, curated experiences with a low path to adoption that can evolve and has its users' real needs at its heart. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, then I'll be around in the chat. So just let me know. Have a, enjoy the rest of the conference. Cheers.